appreciate already that you all have been the most suggestible and cooperative audience. Come down here, move over there. Um, it's all an experiment. That's right. Um, my name is Ann Becker Schutte. I'm a psychologist from Kansas City, and I am the moderator for today's panel. And I am actually going to let my fantastic co participants introduce themselves. So by now, you're probably sick of me. Um, I'm Sarah Kaczarski, otherwise known as Afternoon Napper. This is my last gig of the conference. Uh, E-Patient Advisory Board member, et cetera. Uh, my name's Scott Strange. I'm from, also from Kansas City. Uh, Royals, excitement, baseball in September. Who who the thunk it? Um, so I'm, I'm here. Uh, I'm a type 1 diabetic. I've uh, been that way since 1970. Also suffer from clinical depression, and one does definitely affect the other. Good morning. I'm Lisa Bernstein. I'm also an e-patient advisory board member here at Medicine X, three-time cancer survivor, and uh, had my share of experience with therapy, therapists, uh, PTSD, depression, and whatnot uh, related to illness. So today's panel is going to be a bit different than some of the others that you've seen. Um, as, as some of you heard me say earlier, I am a psychologist, and so I'm pretty biased towards the conversation. So each of, each of my participants has kind of a specific experience about the, the connection between mental health and overall health that they're going to discuss from their own point of view. But what we really would love to hear are some questions and perspectives from you as well, because our point with this panel was that every person up here has had some experience of having physical health and mental health clearly intersect. And right now in our healthcare systems, those two things are treated as though they are absolutely divorced from one another, um, which ultimately I think hurts everyone in the system. It means that patients don't get the care they need. It means that physicians and other healthcare focused folks are feeling stuck and dead ended. It means that psychologists and mental health providers live in little isolated land separate from everyone else. And I don't think anyone benefits from that. Um, so Lisa, I know you had talked about the fact that you've had more than one physical diagnosis. Um, and, and that for you, one of the things you recognized is that emotionally coping with those things seem to have some crossover. Cross, I'm sorry, crossover? Like the, the emotional coping with different physical diagnoses seem to be a lot the same. Oh, but just learning to manage, learning to manage, learning to recognize the symptoms of, you know, the emotional component. Um, sorry, it's just, um, it's, it's very similar to learning how to manage physical symptoms. However, you know, it's not like they're visible, like you have, if you have a broken leg, and it's all this, you know, mishmash of, oh, it's emotional, or oh, it, it's weakness, but it's at the end of the day, it's, it's not, obviously. It's their physical, the, the, the mental and the physical are so intertwined. Yeah, and, you know, I know, Scott, one of the things that, that I saw you reacting to on Twitter was the, the pop-up of words like adherence and compliance. Um, and I know from my perspective as a psychologist, the things that medically people talk about, you know, in terms of comply or not comply are actually behavior choices. Um, you know, as a type one diabetic, you've gotten to do a lot of those choice kinds of moments in your life. Can you talk a little bit about I, I asked Anne if she was sure she wanted to turn this question over to a diabetic. <laughs> I, I also promise not to curse much, so we'll see how that works out. Um, so we're talking about compliance, but wait, no, they've, they've changed the word. It's now adherence, so that's totally different and not you know, bad for patients at all. I just lied to you. Uh, it means exactly the same damn thing. And the problem is the attitude that's underneath that. Um, I've had non-compliant actually written in my record because I questioned the need to do something. Um, so it's, there's, there's, 
The attitude that we get a lot, and you hear a lot of this in the diabetes community, about people leaving their doctor's office in tears mm. because they've been made to feel like a failure. They're ashamed because they can't do what they're supposedly need to do. Um, and one thing that's missing, seems to be really missing from those conversations in that doctor's office is why are the compliance issues, why are people taking their meds? Do they not understand how? Do they need someone to you know, check on them now and again to see that how they're following up with their regimen? It's, it's not simple. I mean, we have, you know, I, what are there, 8,700 hours in a year or something like that? You know, I spend a couple, of, maybe a couple hours with, with doctors during the year, and the rest of it I walk out the door and I'm the guy having to do it. So it's, it's frustrating to be uh, labeled non-compliant when you've been busting your rear end. And you've been trying to do everything mm -hmm. the doctor says. Well, sometimes the treatment isn't quite right yet. It needs adjustment. You need a different medication. Um, type 1 is um, it's a very intensive disease to manage on your own. It's, you know, it's pretty much done by amateurs for the first you know, three or four months, and then you're kind of under a trial by fire. But on the type 2 side, the, the behavior changes are, are much more dramatic. Um, because especially as, as you get older, uh, kind of get set in your ways. I know, I know I am. And all of a sudden you're faced with changing your diet, changing your exercise pattern, changing, you know, just really basic behaviors that you don't think about. And if you're going to, if you start talking about diet and exercise and making it better, how many New Year's Eve, you know, New Year's resolutions have just crashed? I mean, everybody in this room has probably done one of those. So that's hard. Uh, so it's, there's a lot of guilt associated with, uh, with diabetes, um, probably a lot of chronic conditions, where the, it's, it's, the entire burden is placed back on the patient instead of saying, you know, you hear a lot of, you need to do better, instead of, what can I do to help you? Mm -hmm. That second question, that is what we need. And then we can start talking about getting rid of the, but that underlying attitude about compliance. Can I just jump into that? Because with, um, with, with cancer, I've had some similar experiences. There's this drug called tamoxifen that many uh, breast cancer people have to take for at least five years. And uh, there came a point with mine where I, I, I basically said to my doctor, look, if I were rich and I had a chef and a chauffeur and someone to do everything for me and I could just you know, lie around and drool all day long, I could carry on like this for five years. The thing that was so interesting and positive about my exchange with this doctor is that she, unlike the ones that you talk about and many others that I've known too, she wanted to work with me to see, well, how I see this is affecting your lifestyle. It is affecting your emotions. What can we do to make it better? All right, let's try and take you off it for one month and monitor the situation. We did that for a month, checked in again, and I ended up going off it because you know when you had to balance things out. And so here was someone who, rather than making me feel guilty, I felt guilty myself for taking it off, helped me work through it. So when doctors can actually recognize that they are you know, emotional, mental, and consequences as well as physical, and they can work with you and treat you with respect, you know, amazing what can happen. Right. Well, and to your point, Scott, one of the things we've heard from a lot of people in, in the various panels all weekend is that behaviors, whether it's taking medicine or, you know, any of these treatment behaviors, they're really emotional. There's a huge amount of emotion that goes into those behaviors. And when we're not addressing that piece of the picture, at the end of the day, that doesn't get patients towards the best treatment that they need. Now, Sarah, one of the things that you and I talked about prior to the panel was that feeling guilty, feeling tired, feeling worn out, all of these things are pretty stressful. Right. And stress is one of those factors that cuts across multiple diagnoses and is tied into all kinds of physical consequences itself. Can you share a little bit more of the story you shared with me about you learning about stress measurement? So I mentioned yesterday in the other panel about having had this bypass surgery. And 
finding this therapist who specialized in cardiac rehab, which was the closest to it because mine was abdominal versus cardiac. But so one of the early visits that I had with her, uh, we started talking about the events that had happened in the past year. And it was like, I'd had the surgery and then I got married and the guy moved in and we got a dog and then we bought a house and it, like all these things happened and I hadn't really, I don't know, contemplated it that much. And I wasn't the only one having trouble. My now new husband was also like, and the therapist says, well, duh, it's like a hundred points or something is considered to be a stressful year. And this was like 500. I was like, oh, okay. And <laughs> no idea that such things had a rating or that there was this sort of cumulative effect, which for me, it's, I've learned to a certain degree to say, well, okay, so this thing happened and done and we move on. But other people are not necessarily as good, and I'm not even sure if it's entirely a good behavior, but <laughs> good at saying, okay, this thing happened and now it's done and now we're on this thing. And for sure, my husband is not. He is very much cumulative effect kind. And so we try to be more cognizant of these things now. And I try to slow down and not go get a new puppy every time I want one, which would be like, you know, every day. Um, and, and so I try Crazy to slow. No, more like cats. But the puppy, the puppy, the puppy <laughs> was a point of contention. There may or may not have been a Craigslist ad titled, Save My Marriage, Take My Dog. Um, yeah. So um, he tries to ground me. I try to push him. And somewhere along the way, maybe we don't have another 500 point year. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. One more thing regarding, that Sarah's making me think of regarding stress and also what so many of us with you know, life-threatening diagnoses and chronic illnesses experience, and this was talked about quite a bit in your panel yesterday, is, you know, think about how much fear we experience. Think about how much loss and grieving we, we experience. I mean, and I don't know if this is common for others, but for me, I didn't even understand. I mean, I lost my father to suicide when I was four and a half years old. I lost my grandfather. I mean, I lost so many people in my life as a child before even, you know, dealing with with my own, you know, stuff, but I still didn't understand what the word grief meant. Perhaps because, you know, I came from a family with a you know, stiff upper lip and all of that. But, you know, grieving, like Hugo said yesterday, you have to grieve the loss of that healthy you. You have to make all of these sacrifices and accept that, oh, wait, this is my new life. You know, some people call it the new normal and whatever. And if you think about it, how can that not have impact? on your emotions, on your psyche? How can that not add up? And there has to be a way, you know, and I think we're doing it here more and more, of talking about it and destigmatizing it. You know, it's a cultural thing to try and be all macho about things, but that's not realistic. You know, we're human mm. beings. We have hearts and we have souls, and we have feelings and we have nerve endings. And they're not separate. Exactly. <laughs> These are not things that are separate. Feelings happen in an electrobiochemical way inside of your body. And so to act as though mental health concerns are completely some other thing over there isn't paying attention to what's actually going on. Uh, for me and the diabetes community, the type 1 especially, um, insulin is one of the most dangerous drugs on the planet. Um, and I'm going to do a little example here. Would you please? My insulin pump. Um, um, I've just disconnected it, and I'll set it out here for a while. Um, but if I don't, I've got about uh, six or eight hours before I go into a coma. By this time tomorrow, I'm dead. Uh, so you have children growing up with this knowledge. 
Mm-hmm. That breeds a lifetime of stress, anxiety. You, you, you get used to it, sort of, but sometimes it bubbles over. And mm-hmm. that's, it's a major, honestly, it's a major thing that we try not to think of because we would go insane if we did. Well, crazier maybe. Um, and it's also, in diabetes, it's a waiting game. You're always waiting for that complication to set in. Um, and you no, know, the marvelous thing is, if you do everything, you do it right, nothing will happen. So you've been here working on this for years and years, and your doctor you know, keeps telling you, well, you need to stay on this so you don't have complications. Eventually you stop listening because those complications never show up. And then you kind of start slacking. And then, yeah, the complications do show up. And sometimes they don't. It's not predictable, really. Um, but anytime something does happen, you've been busting your rear end, you've been doing everything you're supposed to do, your numbers have always been good, you still get complications. And it's not fair. But that's how it works, and then you are a failure. It's just how else works there. Oh, I like that you bring bring that up because that's interesting for me to contemplate that there is the burden of having something to do that will, if done right, save you. And I could really see how at a certain point you could just be like, you know, and and not do it that that you get mm-hmm. tired. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And right. So I I guess I sort of want your opinion. Free therapy here. Um so I'm in a little bit of a weird place right now because with my FMD, there's nothing to be done. Like the there's no treatment, there's no care, there's very little research. Um, and so the only things to be done, really, are emergency surgery, vascular interventions when something presents. Yet, I go every year, sometimes more often, and I have this ultrasound scan, and we never find anything. And we never prevent anything. And I've just kind of decided it's a giant waste of time. And that I'm not going to do it anymore. Yeah, that's... uh, We kind of... In the diabetes community, we call that burnout. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because, no, it's where It's intensive treatment that you go through. And, yes, you get tired of doing it. Um, There's a lot of work... uh, Right now, at the moment, though, there's a lot of lot of work going on. The do-it-yourself pancreas, the uh, you know CGM in the cloud. The guys at Tide Pool are doing some really great work. But right now, for for most of us, our devices don't talk to each other. I have a continuous glucose monitor here um, that uh, shows me my gives me blood sugar reading every five minutes. What I would really like to do is take the the information off that, which gives me my insulin dose how much insulin I'm taking then, uh, how much carb, how many carbs I've eaten, and compare that to the readings on this. And if I want to do that, you know, it's, it's a relatively simple Excel spreadsheet, but if I want to do that, I have to do it myself. Mm-hmm. Um, there's no motivation in the industry to help us do that. They like to lock everything up in a proprietary fashion. If, if you know, people would not burn you know, Medtronic to the ground, they would keep our data not let us have it, but we need it to survive. So it's, it's, it's a frustrating situation. Well, and so consistently what I'm hearing is living with any of these illnesses, whether it's rare and, you know, unstudied or pretty well known like diabetes or cancer is a lot of work emotionally and practically in a lot of ways. There's this burden of fear or guilt, or, you know, shame, all of those kind of rolled into one. And and it is not unusual for 
anyone facing these kinds of conditions to get tired, burned out, kind of done. What I'm curious about is each of you have mentioned therapy. How did you get there? Was it a referral from someone within the medical community? Was it, you know, someone you knew? How'd you get there? So the first time, the very, very first time, um, was in college, you know, mm -hmm. and I was, I was 19 and everything. And actually, I'd been sick for like two weeks or something, and finally just kind of had gotten annoyed by it and decided I'd go to student health between classes. And I walked in, and I like, tell them what's going on, and they won't let me leave. Like, okay, and they don't tell me why. And so I'm just sitting there and I have to call my classics professor and, and tell her this that I'm here and they won't let me leave and they don't tell me why and I don't know what's going on. And, da, da, da. and they're like, Yeah, you're gonna go upstairs now. You're you're gonna you're gonna go talk to somebody. <laughs> and okay. So and unbeknownst to me, I apparently was like if you look up depression, my picture would be next to it. I had no clue. And so, and that was really, honestly, it was a farce because I went once a week and blatantly lied. Mm -hmm. And it was just nice for me to be able to talk to an adult, but I was like, I don't know you. Yeah, no, everything's fabulous, <laughs> you know, and so, yeah, and so it accomplished absolutely nothing other than giving me this adult connection. And then it's years later, and, and I mentioned the whole group discount with work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so that was therapist too. And, but she actually was really, really awesome. And so it was making that connection that I was like, oh, okay, well, maybe there's something to this. And so then the cardiac was three, and then my GP recommended four. Okay. So, um, so it's a smattering of yeah. of various and sundry finds. Well, I've had a few also in my lifetime. Um, the one one that comes to mind was a, a negative experience was actually twenty years ago with my first cancer diagnosis. I was being taken care of at a very very ooh la la fancy uh, cancer comprehensive cancer center in Los Angeles. And with your radiation visits, you had, it was sort of like you had this like club card. You were, go, you, were, you were also eligible for X number of visits with a therapist and a nutritionist and this and that and the other. So, um, you know, I went um, and I was, I was having panic attacks and a lot of anxiety. I was 29. And uh, the, the therapist says to me, well, you know, just tell the bad thoughts to stop. Just say stop. <laughs> Okay. Um, beyond that, uh, I, I, I found um, other therapists through sort of my own means. And then uh, with my second diagnosis, I was fortunate to be at a very different uh, center for radiation oncology, which is more of a community hospital, where they actually had, go figure, I had never heard of this, a therapist who specialized in cancer patients. That's all that he did. And so I started working with him. And for me also, I know you mentioned yesterday, Sarah, you know, going to see a man. That was very kind of counterintuitive for me. But it actually, you know, it, it was more about the quality of the relationship and the care and mm -hmm. this person's understanding of what he called, just to go to both of your points about, like, living with this fear for the rest of your life of the other shoe dropping. He called it the shadow of cancer, which is, you know, once you've had an early stage cancer and you've done all of the treatment that you're supposed to do, there's actually no way of knowing unless you have a PET scan every five minutes if it's coming back. And the only way you'll ever know if it's coming back is if it does come back. So how do you live with that and how do you manage to cope with that fear? And that was one of the things he taught me instead of just saying stop to those bad thoughts. <laughs> I'm cringing at that. I am. Um, I know that we started a little bit late because upstairs started a little bit late. So we may run a minute or two over depending on what you all need. Um, I also know that we're getting close to the end of our time. And, and I was definitely hoping to make sure there was room for questions if you all have them. Um, 
in order to do that and be respectful of the recording, we're going to have to make sure we get one of the portable mics to you. So if you have questions, let us know and we'll, we'll come to you. <laughs> That's right. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for sharing so honestly about what you what you've experienced and you know like as you were saying, Lisa. A lot of times we tend to hide it, um, but it's just so integral, like the mental health aspect when it comes to any kind of long term disease. You know, I see that in every patient that I work with. And my question to you is, if you could imagine a blank canvas, you could do anything. There was no restriction from healthcare, money, nothing, nothing. What would the perfect world look like to you in terms of what you what would make your journey from a holistic perspective the best? I'll take that one because um, that's the, that's what I. The, the whole person thing is sort of my, my big bandwagon at the moment. Um, I, I wish that what we did with our healthcare was to respect from step one that people do have these diverse needs. You know, that unfortunately we've had this fantastic explosion of knowledge which has led to this sort of hyper fragmentation where you specialize in only index finger surgery. Um, you know, and, and that's great if what you need is index finger surgery and you have somebody who is a super expert just on that. However, that incredible amount of knowledge and that hyper specialization has meant that we treat people as though they are this collection of individual separate bits. And that doesn't serve the whole person. And so in my blank canvas, you know, blank check kind of world, we would train together, you know, so that mental health folks know how to talk to medical folks and medical folks know how to talk to medical mental health folks. Because I hear a lot of physicians say, I don't know anything about depression. I don't know how to talk about depression. I don't want to ask about these things because it freaks me out when patients cry in my office. <laughs> okay, you don't have to be good at that. I am, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> get some referral sources and, and know someone so that when a patient starts to cry in your office, if nothing else, you have a business card to give them. Ideally, you know, we could walk down the hall because we'd be practicing in shared settings. Um, maybe without all having to be eaten by HCA. Um. That's how I, that's how I was referred to the the um, sorry the therapist who specialized in cancer patients. Mm -hmm. I was crying in the office of the radiation oncologist, and you know she she recognized what was going on. There and are she some physicians me. who are awesome at that. And I, I mean, I, I have folks in Kansas City. I have a GI doc who is amazing at cross referrals, you know? And, and so, but that's, there was no framework for that to happen. Like we just kind of had to find each other by accident. But that, I want to add to what you were saying with all of this, is, which is in, in my ideal, and I, we, we've touched on it quite a bit, I think this weekend. What about teaching medical students right from the get go, not only doing cross training with you guys, but also to understand their own humanity, their own emotions, and to learn mm -hmm. how to live with them. Because of course, a great defense mechanism is to be, OK, I'm just going to deal with the patient and wall off any feelings. But you know, how does that end up eating you up at night, well, or be turning you bitter, or whatever it is, over the years? We got to it a tiny bit yesterday that there's not a lot of permission for medical professionals to have their own feelings about yeah. doing some very difficult things. Yeah. Doing some very difficult things. I know behind you had a question, yeah? And then there's one further back than you after that. So if we can keep moving the mic. Uh, thank you guys so much for sharing your experiences. I am a first year medical student here, so I guess this is a very good Make event. Make friends with here. some psychology students. Exactly. <laughs> um, I actually studied psychology in college. So, Great. Um, in terms of, I have my first patient encounter on Wednesday, and so it'll be a great time to get some solutions. So I want to know what you guys felt, because I know that a lot of patients, my family, 
you know, we have a type 2 diabetic in my family, and we don't like being shuttled around to other doctors. It feels like mm -hmm. doctors are just casting us off and saying, okay, I don't want to deal with you. You go somewhere else. So as much as cross-referrals are really helpful in terms of sharing expertise, they can be a burden on the patient in terms of their resources and their time. So I want to know how, uh, in terms of just actionable steps, how do you think doctors might be able to, in their own practice, uh, m more efficiently accommodate for mental health in their practice, even if they're not psychiatrists or neurologists? Do you guys have any advice for you doctors? You can do, I mean, the, the stress scale that Sarah was talking about, just a baseline measurement. So illustrative. Yeah, <laughs> I like, mean, and, and that's... And it's points, and it's so cool. it, It's that. numbers, it's addition, it can be put into a patient portal, they could fill it out in advance. Um, a basic, how are you feeling? Have you felt depressed or anxious kind of question to kind of get a tag on it is really good. Also, though, I think... Physicians have a really powerful role in normalizing mental health services and saying, gosh, the things you're experiencing are absolutely natural given what's going on for you. And the most helpful thing would be to spend a little time talking with somebody who supports people in coping with that. I agree. I think the way it's the handoff, right? The referral, mm -hmm. it's, it's all in how it's done. And if if the physician who's referring you to the mental health, I know health this person. I person, trust this person. It matters. Does gives you context. Yeah. It's not you're not being just dumped off because I don't want to deal with you. It's you have a, a finger problem. I'm going to get you to a finger specialist because I can't do that for you. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's not just I'm going to get you to a finger yeah. specialist because the one that I was, know and the yeah, one I trust. That was the yeah. thing about the dude that I had. Um, dude. Uh, <laughs> his name is Steve. Uh, I, I, that would be awesome, <laughs> man. Only in therapy. I do. So, um, but my GP specifically said, like, I know him. Mm -hmm. He is yeah. good people. Same. I think you yeah. would like him. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, if you can have even for three that yeah. you can make referrals to. So that patients have choices. So that, yeah, and I mean, because there may be men who want to see a female counselor. There may be females who want to see. And so having that, and then just everybody's style is different, yeah. and it really is mm -hmm. a relationship because, I mean, yes, I have had four, but there have been a few others. So it's like, huh? Yeah, no. No. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. And there's there's one person, Thank two you, back from much. you. and. Okay. okay. Awesome. Uh, Tegan. No, pause. <laughs> that was like a chorus. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to, ex can you hear me? I just wanted to expand on the, if you do need to make a referral, how to do it in an encouraging way. I was, my psychiatrist was referring me to a therapist and she knew how I've had bad experiences with therapists. Um, she told me about the therapist. She said, she was a hippie in the 60s. <laughs> She's an artist. She has a little dog that she brings with her sometimes. She told me about this woman so that it wasn't just this faceless person yeah. that was mm -hmm. going to make decisions. Yeah. And so I was just going to say, well, and get to know the therapist yeah. so you can recommend them. I tweeted this yesterday, and we were, especially we were talking about, you know, how do you find the best doctors, or what does that mean to you? Well, I ended up, because I'd seen a few and been referred to a few therapists, developing my own sort of protocol for interviewing mm -hmm. a therapist. I remember the first time I did it, it was, you know, it required my, I, because this person had been chasing me down because my previous therapist had had to leave the country very abruptly, and I was, you know, kind of lost, and I was saying, no, I'm not coming in, I don't want to bother with this. And so she kept calling me, and she said, look, just finally, just come in one time, and then, you know, you can make your mind up for yourself. So I thought, fine, I'll go in, but these are the but things I that I like need. It. Yeah. You know, and this is me being an e-patient without realizing it. It was like, okay, I need someone who, when I tell them I've lived in Paris, that they're not going to get starry-eyed and think it's glamorous. I just happen to live there. I need someone who understands the <laughs> Greek, you know. It wasn't glamorous. I was living there. Um, and, I, I, you know, I, I, I'm a creative person, and I'm dealing with all of this, like, angst about being, I need someone who understands that. I want someone who's an older person, someone maybe who's an older woman. And I, so I had all these criteria, and when the woman came in, I said, so I have some questions for you. And she was, you know, clearly taken aback. But she went with it. 
And it's the most empowering thing that you can do. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah. if you can know you're patient enough, because like if you came to me and you're like, man, this <coughs> therapist is just like so sweet and pink. Well, I like pink. Uh, flowery <laughs> and, and like all this mushy stuff. I'd be like, why are you talking to me? Because that's not going to gel with like who I am as a person. And so I like my therapist to have a sense of humor because I tend to be rather caustic about myself. And, and if they can't laugh with me and they're just sitting there like a sad sack, you know, or they're going to be excessively emotive, we're, we're not going to get anywhere. And so, yeah, it's, it's dating. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it is. Well, I mean, and and what I would what I would say really to any medical student, any healthcare professional who who feels overwhelmed by this stuff is truly, you know, find me on Twitter. Um, you know, reach out to psychologists or other mental health providers in your community. Go to coffee. You know, get to know a couple of people because if you can make this a I really see you're in a lot of distress, and I want to address your pain, not a, wow, you're really overwhelming, and I need you to not be here with me anymore um, kind of moment, <laughs> then that's really powerful as opposed to dismissive. And we can do right here one more time, and then I don't want to make you guys not get coffee, so we'll wrap up. Thank you. I think coming back to uh, to the ground and logistics, so. Um, in terms of referrals and reimbursement, do we only only MDs referral um, counts? How does that work? Oh, like no. I'm trying to figure out how that works because I work as a nurse at the cancer center. So. Anyone, I mean, at least in my situation, anyone can refer to me. How um, do you? How do we make sure that the patient knows who's covering the cost and they're aware of it? You know, if they call me. I give them a series of questions to check that. Um, you know, it, it's, for most people, it's insurance coverage. Um, mine is, has been out of pocket because the <coughs> it, it's a long story, but the, the plan we have uh, that my company uses has such dismal reimbursement terms that most people most uh, providers have dropped them. Um, you, go there, you go to their page, you know, find a provider, find someone, uh, he, you know, page after page after page, but you call their practice, no, we don't take that insurance. And what the insurance company is doing is saying, oh, this, this facility, this hospital takes our insurance. Oh, this doctor has rights at this hospital, so he, he takes our insurance. And it's it's misleading at best, but almost to the point of malfeasance. Well, and, and I think that that's a whole nother panel on helping you know, patients access some of these services because there are ways to do it. There are plenty of psychologists that do sliding scale rates. You know, there are plenty of other mental health folks that do. It's a matter of, of being, you know, this is a, another subset of health literacy that you know, we need to give people the right questions to ask. And you know, if we were going back to the perfect world thing, it would be a little bit more seamless because anyone who is ready to seek mental health help is already in a great deal of pain. Yeah. Um, and and so presenting them with a bunch of hoops to jump through in order to get to those services is problematic, to say the least. Um, we are so grateful that you all came. Um, I know you had a lot of choices this morning. And if you do have questions, please reach out to any of us. Um, if this is a topic, this sort of connection and conversation that interests you, um, that's actually something that, that we'll be continuing in a tweet chat called that's hashtagged MedPsych um, Tuesday evenings. So you can look for that hashtag if you want to be a part of the ongoing conversation. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all.